In Guinea, the only certainty seems to be that people have to fend for themselves. This order is ready. Today, the challenge facing Pierre and his assistants is to how to get these medicines in record time from Conakry to Kisidugu on the other side of the country. We need more broncholine. Guinea Conakry is still plagued by serious disease such as polio, diphtheria and rabies. The pharmacy's greatest concern is to get the vaccines out to where they're needed before the climate ruins them. Pierre has no refrigerated truck or ice box even. He sends his vaccines in a simple box wrapped in a bag of ice. We pray God that this arrives in good condition and that the medicine arrives safely and quickly. It's a vaccine, so it's only good for 24 hours. And that's the first hurdle. To get to the transporter at the bus depot is an epic journey in itself. A downpour has caused huge traffic jams. How are we getting through this? Oh, how are the others doing it? Oh, it's incredible. And true. This is so tiring. There are too many jams. The annoyed driver blasts his horn, frightening a passerby. Oh, what are you doing? You're trying to kill me, you idiot. Oh, you're insulting me, but you're in luck. I'll leave it to God to decide who's right and who's wrong. You fool. Okay, that's it, that's it now. Conakry, the capital, is at a standstill. Petty salesmen and beggars try to make the most of the vehicles that are stuck. Stuck in one place for hours, creeping forward at a snail's pace. Oh, we've been here five hours now. Oh, it's the traffic jam, otherwise we'd have done it in one hour. Hello, I'm on my way. We're moving. Oh, it's a real worry, this. There are patients who are waiting for these medicines and must be in pain. Human lives are at risk. After six hours in the traffic jam, they make it to the bus depot. The medicines are handed over to Abbas, who owns a bush taxi. The pharmacist makes his point. Listen, what uh, Salui is wrapping over there, it's a vaccine. If the trip takes longer than 24 hours, it'll melt, so you must get there before that. The fragile vaccine is placed under the front seat. Well, my task's completed now. I've dropped off the package, made sure it's well taken care of, and now I can go home. For a few cents, so-called coxers assist with placing the baggage and tying it firmly into place. He's a coxer. He's a coxer too. Coxers are out-of-work drivers. Since there's no work, we have to make do. It's only little work, but it helps them get by. How much do you make them? Ooh, about five or ten euros a day. It's the same pay as a teacher. Guinea Conakry has no railway and planes are prohibitively expensive. Taxis are the most common way to get around the country, and drivers take advantage by gouging clients. This passenger tries to get credit for her and her baby. My mother-in-law died, and my husband told me to come home immediately. Uh, once we get there, he'll pay you. All I've got is 10 euros. I don't have enough. The driver feels sorry for her, and a deal is struck. But another passenger is more of a problem. He's hurt his hand and wants a window seat. I cut myself in a farm machine. However, the man in the baseball cap has reserved the seat. Listen, I paid for the seat. You're not telling me now I have to move. 
What do you want? I want to be where I chose. But he's injured. If he was fine, I wouldn't have asked you to change seats. Finally, nine passengers, two babies and two drivers are packed on board. Abbas is proud of his car. It's only 22 years old. It doesn't look too new, does it? It is new. I just bought it. It's got only 450,000 kilometers on the clock. Three hours later, the passengers and the vaccine finally start the journey. With the time lost in the traffic jam, the ice in which the vaccine has been packed has been melting now for eight hours. If the driver doesn't make Kisidugu in 16 hours, the vaccines might as well be thrown away. The national road to Kisidugu is 680 kilometers of potholes. Few drivers respect the rules of the road and accidents are frequent. A quarter of the country is covered in forest. The ineffectual government has played no part in building or maintaining the road, which is now done by the locals. There are accidents. One person fell off. The terrible roads tire the already nervous drivers. I'm at the end of my tether. The delays paralyze the nation's economy. It can take two hours to reach the top of the hill. And yet, Guinea Conakry is a rich country. It's rich in gold and diamonds, but the inhabitants see none of the benefits. Kisidugu Hospital has but one ambulance. We have to save this woman. We have to save her life. Poverty is everywhere, and families are forced to send their kids out to work. I can't, I can't do it. Do it like this. For most Guineans, life is a daily struggle. The bush taxi driver's patience has tested to the limit, even before leaving the capital. The two drivers constantly swap over. The boot is not exactly comfortable. They've wasted two hours stuck in traffic. The deadline for the vaccine means the drivers keep going through the night. Since they set off, there's been a strong smell of petrol in the passenger compartment. Still, none of them seem particularly concerned. In fact, some of the passengers seem reassured. We believe that any time you can smell petrol, it keeps the evil spirits away. The petrol fumes might keep the supernatural at bay, but they can't stop the living. Highway robbers are a constant danger. One week ago, one of the gangs stopped some vehicles on this road and attacked it with weapons. Uh, there were even some renegades for the military amongst them. About midnight is the time we like to park somewhere until 5.30 in the morning to avoid people like that. The stop is a welcome relief to the cramped passengers. Their bodies ache and their stomachs are empty. I'm okay, but I'm hungry. <laughs> Come on, service. <laughs> As a precaution, they wait until daylight before setting off again.
By the early morning, the vaccines have been on the road for 22 hours and it's time to press on. But Sharif is obliged to take it slowly. Even if we know that we're transporting urgent medicines that have to be rushed, we can't because the road's so bad. We'd have an accident. Such calls to order come all along the route. The gamble seems to have paid off. After 24 hours, the bush taxi pulls into Kisidugu. But luck is against them. The pharmacy is closed and the vaccines will only be good for a few more minutes as the ice has surely melted. The driver asks around among the shopkeepers. Do you have the pharmacist's telephone number? Hello? Yes, I wanted to let you know that we've got some medicines for you that we brought in from Conakry. The pharmacist is on the way, but when will he arrive? One passenger is fed up of waiting. Oh, this isn't right. You're meant to be a taxi service. I paid you to take me to Gwengetu. Now, in the name of God, get us out of here. We're even more in a rush than you are. The pharmacist arrives one hour later. The vaccines are put into a fridge. Relief all round, as they're just about still in good condition. Okay. Guinea Conakry bush taxis are a lifeline. These communal pickups venture just about everywhere. Apart from inside the dense forests. Those that live here are the country's forgotten peoples. There are hardly any tracks that serve their villages. The Konyagis clan are a case in point. Buba is a medicine man, and at 82 years old, his natural remedies seemed to serve him well. He sells his medicinal plants to the villagers of Pol, perched high on these cliffs. The old man makes his way up there using a 300-year-old path and an ancient ladder fashioned out of bamboo and plant stems that snakes up the cliff face. Ever since God created the world, it's been the only way up to the village. We have to drag our baggage up. On the way up and on the way down. There have been accidents. One woman was holding onto a creeper when it snapped. But she fell and she survived, though. Uba's village honors its dead by giving them the best views. Something that raises a few logistical problems. Our cemetery is up there. If someone dies down in the plains, we have to carry their body up the cliff. We use a basket made from the creepers to hoist the body for burial at the top. Most villages and even towns in Guinea Conakry are lacking the most basic services. Kisidugo and its 200,000 inhabitants have power only a few hours every week. The main hospital has an emergency unit, but it's reserved for pregnant women. Okay, let's go. Mariam, a nurse, dashes off towards the only ambulance she has. It was donated by UNICEF 13 years ago. Without any means to maintain it, it's a miracle it's still running. Due to the price of petrol, it can only be used once a day. We've had a call to go pick up a pregnant woman. So we're heading off to pick her up and take her to the hospital. It's an emergency, but she's 75 kilometers away. We have to be quick to save this woman. We have to save her life.
Sometimes we risk our own lives in taking these roads. We're scared. The nurses waste a lot of time on these roads in the bush. There are no road signs with the names of the villagers, and there are as many tracks as there are directions. It's a real labyrinth. Do you know which is the way to Telikoro? Yes, it's the track over there. First, you go to Nayama, and there you ask for directions to Kampe, and then you head to Medina Kampe. Okay, thanks. We're in a rush. We have to go. Two hours later, and they still can't locate the pregnant woman. Where's Telikoro? It's the other direction. To make things worse, the old ambulance breaks down. Usman, come on, hurry up. It's the battery. It keeps moving around. What are you looking for? A rope. Do you have some rope? Just a short piece will work. Here's one. Thanks a lot. Come on, Usman. I'm just tying it up. As she waits for the makeshift repairs, Mariam bumps into the pregnant woman's father-in-law. Worried, he'd set out on foot for help. She's been sick since Wednesday. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Today's Saturday. Four days of agony. Mother and baby are both in danger. Why didn't you call Wednesday? It's been four days now. The woman's in her village in great pain. She'll lose her baby and she must be worn out by now. I can't stand seeing a woman suffer. Three hours after leaving the hospital, Mariam can finally attend to the patient. The baby is poorly positioned and the 18-year-old girl is in urgent need of a caesarean. Grandmothers act as doctors in the bush, matrons who help with childbirth. In the village, all the old ladies gathered round and gave her natural medicines, saying that this would allow her to give birth. But she can't from down there. It has to be a caesarean. They don't know that they're wrong. Her husband tries to comfort her as best he can. There's no stretcher and she lies on some tarpaulin. We need to change her position to make it less painful. We have to lift her. She wants to turn over? Sit her up against yourself. It'll be all right. When we get there, they'll operate and everything will be fine. Whatever the dangers are, we need to get to the hospital quickly so she can be operated. The hospital has no running water and the operating room only has one set of surgical clamps. It's a very sharp pain. There is at least an anaesthetist, and mother is soon asleep. The caesarean goes well, but the baby isn't breathing. Without reanimation machines, the nurses try the impossible. There's no beat. There's no heartbeat. The baby's dead. And just think, we went all that way to her village to bring her back here, and the child doesn't make it. That's, that's just awful. At least let's now try to save the mother. Four days of contractions have paralyzed her legs. The hospital has no suitable medicines. In Guinea Conakry, it's up to the patients to purchase them. Go and buy the medicines for your wife. The pharmacy is over there. The young woman's husband is desperate. I, I don't have any money to buy prescription drugs. My parents might have helped, but they're a long way away. I'm, I'm stuck. 
Without social security, many families here are unable to provide for their loved ones. The hospital pharmacy sells medicines for 10 times less than the private sector, but it still proves too expensive. Hello. How much are the medicines? Three and a half euros. Oh, I don't have that kind of money. Listen, help. I really need that medicine. I don't have any money. In Guinea Conakry, life is worth as little as three and a half euros. Maybe it's the camera or genuine sympathy, but in the end, the pharmacist pays for the medicine himself. There's enough to treat his wife for a week. Any longer, and it'll be up to the husband to come up with more money. According to UNICEF, over 15,000 babies and almost 4,000 women die in childbirth each year in Guinea Conakry. Getting medicines to where they're needed around the country is a real problem. Store it properly so it won't break. Don't worry, no problem. Hey, Lei, move the cans and put the medicines there. And the transportation itself is by no means ideal for such fragile cargo as medicines. Alassane is the proud owner of this old truck. The tire's punctured. You have to change it. Hey, guys, open up the, uh, the bonnet. Check the engine is all right. Come on, give him a hand. You need to completely move it up. Hey, there's an old lady in the cabin. His ancient truck brings in just enough to feed his large family. Eight children and two wives. Fatih, aged 50, and Erika, 21. Come on, time to eat, everyone. Yeah, there's some tow. Tow is corn flour and water, the poor man's dish. The entire family depends on Alassane's earnings, but at this point, they're very thin. It's really delicious. We don't have any money, so we get by as best as we can. My truck's too old. I hardly make any profits from it at all. But without making these trips, we'd have nothing to eat. Here, take this money for expenses. Is that all there is? Yes, it's not much. Give me some more. I haven't got any more. It's not enough to feed nine people. If you don't give me some more, I don't know how I'll manage. There are too many of us for this. Just take it back. No, no, take it, take it. It's all I've got. So what do you expect me to do with one and a half euros? We need twice that, at least. Look, there's nothing in my pockets. I don't want your money. Take it back. Listen, you know my truck's old. Don't push me. It's not enough for everyone. All right, all right. I don't have any more. What do you want me to do? What you've given isn't enough. I have no more. If you don't give me more, then no one will have anything to eat until you come back. That's your problem. I'll give you some when I cut back. The old engine groans away, and Alassane wonders whether he'll be able to make it all the way to Tokono, 65 kilometers away. The journey costs less than a bush taxi, but passengers are taking a greater risk. Falling off is common, as the ancient truck's carcass is shaken every which way. It's 65 kilometers to Tokono. That'll take us about six hours. Six hours to cover 65 kilometers, because the road is so bad. There are holes everywhere, and a lot of accidents. For each delay, the passengers and clients want compensation. I own the truck. I bought it on credit, and I need to repay my loan. But the road is slowly destroying my vehicle, and soon it'll completely break down. I'm at the end of my tether. The road is hardly, if ever, repaired.
Passengers have to get off. The road's simply too bad. It's the same every time. And it's been getting worse now for, for two years. It's worse than ever. We'll need to remove all the mud that's over there. Without batting an eyelid, the passengers get down to it. Luckily, there's some coal on the truck. Some of it will be sacrificed as it makes perfect filler. Oh, this road's no good. But we need to make a living. It needs to be repaired so we can survive. Also bandits who might attack us any time. It's terrible. I don't know how much more we can put up with. The robbers attacked us three months ago. We were going slowly because of the road. They took all my cash. Two and a half thousand euros. It's just too much. I've now had enough. For hours, passengers alternate between walking and riding in the truck. We're suffering. We need help. Because of the state of the road, the price of goods has gone up. What used to cost 10 euros, we now have to pay three or four times that much. That's a lot for poor people like us. Some make this journey twice a week. When it rains, we use the canvas to cover ourselves. It's all we can do. It's not easy, but it's all we've got. The downpour lasts just 10 minutes. It's enough to keep them cold for the rest of the trip. At Tokonu, the truck's arrival is an occasion to make a few pennies. The little delivery boys flock around the truck. Do you know where the pharmacy is? Yes, sir. Right, well, let's get going then. Keita makes 50 centimes for every errand. The pharmacy doubles as a greengrocer's. Medicines are stacked in between the cigarettes and cans of jam and condensed milk. The medicines are sold individually, regardless of the number of days of treatment. I want anti-malaria pills for my child. It's been sick for two days. It's very expensive. One dose costs 50 centimes, a fortune. Few Guineans are able to pay for a full course of treatment. Nine-year-old Kater, the delivery boy, works as hard as any adult. He chases clients all day long, non-stop. It's my mother who told me to do this. The hardest part is lifting up the packages. Kato is by no means the only child who is sent out to work by their family. Some start at an even younger age. One hundred and eight small kids slave away in this wood workshop. Or, according to the foreman, they goof off. He claims all attend school and they're here on internships to learn about the trade. Hey, you need to rub it properly to get it smooth. 
Like this. And hurry up about it. Hey, you. Where's your sandpaper? Don't you have any? Here, take it. Take it and then come over here. There. Now you need to rub it against the wood. That's the way. Up and down. This is how you should do it. How old is that little kid? He's five. All those bigger kids over there, they all started at this age. Thanks to these internships, he's helped many find their vocation. But the foreman then forgets he's still wearing a microphone. I told them all you kids were at school, and since they were the long holidays, they should come here to get some training so they have something to occupy themselves. So we shouldn't say anything that might upset them. What does he want to be when he grows up? You should say you want to be a carpenter. I want to be a carpenter. Do you like sanding? You should say you like it a lot. I like it a lot. His kids, aged between 5 and 16, all work 12 hours a day, and the physical cost is quite shocking. Are you tired after working all day? Very tired. How do you feel when work's over? It hurts. There, my shoulders, they really ache. Lamine, age nine, repeats the same movements all day. It really hurts if you're not used to it. You see those marks on my hand? My palm gets very hot. It's the plane that makes it hot. It hurts all the time now. Hey, Lamine. Kids, come on. Time to go home. The small army of little workers lives in a dormitory three kilometers away. Their desperately poor families have rented them out in exchange for some money. Some kids haven't seen their parents in six years. Here's the man behind this lucrative business, who fills in as the father, and his three wives act as the mothers. He's the one who's in charge here. He's our master. He trained all the team here. I set up this entire thing. It's run along military lines. After a day's work, the 108 kids have little time for rest. Each has a domestic chore to fulfill. Not one of these kids will ever see a school book. But for the boss, that's not really important. Out in the bush, the peasants learn by word of mouth. They bring me their children so they can learn a more profitable trade than farming. I set them up here, and until they learn the business, they remain here. For some, that means three or four years. But if I take them in very young, they might stay six or seven years. After, I free them. I've done this since 1966. This is my 30th group of kids. According to UNICEF, 25% of young Guineans work instead of attending school. And many schools are inaccessible anyway, due to the condition of the roads.
It's the same story with health. These medicines are on their way to a dispensary in the middle of the jungle. Only someone as crazy as Hamaka would risk such a journey. Come on, load up quickly. We're late. There's a lot of mud down there and a lot of holes. Amaka wasn't meant to be a trucker. His father wanted him to be someone important, and his family made many sacrifices to pay for Amaka's education. He graduated as an accountant but never found work, so Amaka resigned himself to follow his father into becoming a driver. This is Azil. It's Russian. It's more than 30 years old. I inherited it from my father. Is it a good inheritance? Oh, yes. During the 1960s, President Sekou Touré allied himself with the Soviet Union. The communists imported their ideology, along with Russian heavy-duty trucks. The Zil-130 is one of the last survivors. If I leave in the morning, I should get there by the evening. But often I don't get there until the following morning. It can take two hours or three just to make it up one slope. It's tough. The mule track is actually a regional road. It connects Kisidugu and Koniadu, 45 kilometers away. roads blocked up ahead. We're stuck. At each bog, the rhythm of the spades resumes, and it's always to the same tune. Amaka is encouraged. But not much is achieved. The answer may lie in this oddly shaped mud sculpture. That's a termite's nest. It makes good traction for the tires. You put them in the mud, and that should do the trick. The small ones don't sting, it's the big ones with red heads that sting. The insects are sacrificed in vain. Fascinated by the old truck, members of an Italian Catholic mission stop by to take some photographs. This man, flanked by two Italians, is a priest. Why are you here? We're friends of Don Piero. They've come with me to visit the parish of Cognadu. Are you sure you can carry me? Yes, of course. Don't drop me. What should we do? Go on on foot? What do you think? Yeah, come on, let's walk. So, are you in trouble, or have you just met a new boyfriend? Oh, he's a priest. Yes, I am. But maybe she's found another fiancé. Is it the hand of God? As soon as the priest leaves in his four-wheel drive, the truck emerges from the quagmire. The pebbles are all from the bush. We bring them along and use them well, when there are holes to fill. This time they had a few too many, and they dumped the excess.
Amaka's truck stops. Its engine lacks power. It's the engine's belt that's split. It's not serious. We have a spare belt. It'll just take 10 minutes. It's quick. We know how to do it. There's an apprenticeship before we start driving, so we can cope with this on our own, as we don't have much money. In Guinea, such as the poverty that everything gets recycled. We can tie up the bags of rice with it, or we can use it to fix the tarpaulin onto the truck. But as they get back on board, by nightfall, they've been driving for ten hours. I'm cold. The nurse of the dispensary collects the packages of medicine. He's been expecting them for three months, and the boxes are quite small. He hopes they'll be enough to replenish his stock. The eye cream is no longer good and can't be used. There are people who come to be treated, and if we don't have any cream, well, that's no good. Among the medicine Benjamin has received are vaccines against measles, diphtheria, tetanus, and polio. He'll start vaccinating children first thing the following day, as he has no means to conserve the precious serums. There's no electricity. The fridge runs on petrol, and we don't have a generator. We have to pay for the petrol for the fridge, and often we don't have the money. This two-year-old baby is too weak to be vaccinated. I visited the family yesterday and told them to bring their baby along. You have to go and see them to make them come in. Six kilos, 35. This child is two and only weighs 6.4 kilos. It's a serious case of malnutrition. My child has always been weak. He was born underweight. He's always had stomach ache. So I took him for treatment at the hospital in Kisidugu, but it was too expensive. When you don't have the means, it's difficult to pay for prescriptions that cost 20 or 30 euros. And if you don't have enough to pay for it, no one will give you the money. She had to pay, and that's why she came back with the child. Given his current state, his father rejected him because he wasn't growing. Uh, so his mother has taken her child and gone back to live with her parents. 
I sometimes use part of my own salary to help out women like this. But we don't have the means either, so we can't help everybody. Maybe just one in a hundred. The rest we can't help. This is a dietary compliment. It's rich in energy. In Guinea Conakry, one in ten children die before reaching the age of five. No doctors ever visit these remote villages. Benjamin tries to fill the void, but he's just a nurse, even though an experienced one. Benjamin says this 50-year-old man has a burst aneurysm. He treats him as best he can. Give him this medicine twice a day, it'll help. What'll happen to this man? Well, he'll stay like that. He can't talk anymore. We did what we can for him. His family has what it needs to, to help him. I can't say he'll be cured, but it's a step in the right direction. Goodbye. Have a good day. In Guinea Conakry, life expectancy is about 50. Everybody knows me here. 